actually our previous conversation was commented by various media in Poland and even by Ria Novosti in Russia. And I hope it will be the same time. So first, I would like to warmly welcome Scott, who has a growing group of fans in Poland and Russian journalists listening to us. And I, I will show you this. Uh, as you, I don't know if you speak Russian, but it is from Ria Novosti, and they speak uh, about our uh, our conversation which we make here, and it's uh, nervous a lot of uh, the, the 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 Polish uh, the the Polish pro-government media. <laughs> Okay. Do you want to die? Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, so now the second things, um, Scott. As I said, there are some people in Poland who really appreciate appreciate what you do. Unfortunately, there are also people who don't like you very much. There were <laughs> comments under our last video in which you were called a Russian onutsa. Onutsa is a piece of wool material that used to be um, instead of socks. And in the conditions of the Russian winter, it is a very practical solution to protect your feet from frost. In Polish language, this term has a chauvinistic or even racist character, and it's supposed to some symbolize the primitiveness and barbarism of the Russian nation which does not yet know what sucks are. The last time <laughs> when such racist terminology was used in Poland was during the German occupation in relation to Jews. The Nazis said that the Jews were a primitive nation that smelled of garlic and spread typhus. Today, again, in Poland, such primitive racist comparison are used in the public space. And people like you and me who criticize NATO policies in the east are called russian onutsa how do you assess the fact that the americanization of polish society has made such chauvinistic terms appear in the mainstream media without shame and i will show you what is this russian onutsa uh, <laughs> this is not this which i wanted to show where is it uh, so this is this is the Russian onutsa. Uh, it's like this, after like ah. this, and after like <laughs> this. And it is the most uh, uh, for everybody who is not agree with policy of NATO. Now now they called him Russian onutsa. Uh, okay, so maybe uh, I will <laughs> give you a word. <laughs> Well, first of all, to be compared with anything that provides warmth and comfort in uh, times of extreme <laughs> cold is a compliment. So I thank the people of Poland who have given me this distinguished honor of uh, being compared to uh, the most practical of uh, footwear. Um, you know, I mean, <laughs> look, here, look, yeah, I'm being facetious. Um, but this is the tactic. You know, OK, you don't agree with what I say. I respect that. I, I absolutely respect that. I come from a nation where freedom of speech is one of the cornerstone values of this country. In fact, what makes us strong as a community, as an American community, is the ability of the community to get together and discuss an issue, have a debate, a dialogue, a discussion, a civil discussion, um, where people hash it out so that everybody can become informed with different opinions and then make a decision, an educated decision, an informed decision about which uh, argument they support the most. It's sort of what makes democracy work. Um, and so Poland calls itself a democracy. Are you? Are you really? Because if you were a democracy, if I said something, what you would do is raise up your hand, theory, you know, figuratively, and say, I, I, I have a response. Mr. Ritter, you said X. However, have you considered Y and Z and how it influences A, B, and uh, maybe J comes in, and would that change your opinion? Because you've said something, but I don't think you've taken into account all the facts that are out there, and you might get a different interpretation. Now, if they did that, I would sit there and go, wow, 
either, yes, I've considered all that, but I've also looked at H, I, and M, and N, and I've factored in here, and I come back with a counter, and then they could say, hmm, okay, and we see we're having a nice discussion here. It's a respectful discussion, um, but that's not what happened because they don't want to have a discussion. They have already reached a foregone conclusion, and the last thing they want is voices of dissent, especially voices of dissent that come at it from an informed perspective. And uh, and so they engage in these ad hominem attacks. They, they, they insult people. They do everything they can to avoid doing that which apparently they can't do, come up with an informed, intelligent, civil response. It's a sign of weakness on their part. And everybody mm -hmm. who observes this has to understand that those who enter a discussion with fact put forward a position lay it out there on the line are the braver people they possess intellectual and moral courage those who refuse to engage but instead attack for the sole purpose of suppressing that point of view they're the cowards not only are they cowards it means that their idea can't be defended. That's the important thing here. Their idea cannot be defended. They are incapable of defending their idea. And so rather than confront the fact that they are wrong, they attack. That's not how a democratic society works. So if Poland wants to call itself a democracy, then you better grow up and don't learn from American democracy because we're <laughs> giving you the bad lessons because in America, we do it even better than you. Trust me, we know how to insult, we know how to attack, we know how to suppress um, because we've lost the ability, even though on paper we have free speech, we've lost the ability to function as a society where free speech is actually a virtue that uh, is embraced by the powers. They fear free speech, and so they suppress free speech. And if Poland wants to be better than us, then please don't suppress free speech. If you have a problem with anything I've said, I swear I would love to have a debate with you. I would love to have a discussion with you. I would love to have a dialogue. I will not ignore you. I'm not one of those people. And I'll give you the other assurance. If your argument is based with fact and sound logic and reasoning, and I, after hearing your argument, say, they got a point, I'll be the first one to come out and say, wow, you educated me, you informed me, I've changed my opinion, I now see that maybe you're right. I'm not one of these people that's married to an idea simply because I've articulated it. I'm married to the truth. And if you can guide me to the truth, if I'm somehow misguided, I want to have this discussion. So why are you afraid of me? Don't be afraid of me. You should embrace me as part of a team, you and I, and everybody else involved, heading towards the truth, which everybody should be interested in. Okay, so I will read second question. Um, I would like to turn to military matters. From history, we remember various famous fortifications on the border, such as the Great Wall of China, or Hadrian Roman Wall. Um, in the history of 20th century, the most famous are the French Maginot Line and the German Siegfried Line. I would like to ask you, have you heard about the Błaszczak Line, about the, <laughs> <laughs> about the network of Polish fortification on the border with Kaliningrad and on the border with Belarus? How do you assess the effectiveness of such police fortifications? In your opinion, will the Błaszczak line make President Putin afraid of the Polish <laughs> government? So uh, firstly, I will present you Błaszczak, uh, because maybe you don't know. This is this guy. He's the Polish minister of, uh, of the war. Um, and as you see, he is on the knee. Uh, and here is the flag of the UPA, UPA, the red, uh, red, uh, black flag of the guys who killed uh, more than thousand, uh, uh, one hundred thousand Polish citizens. And he's uh, so it's him. Uh, here is the with the Polish prime minister, and this is the Błaszczak line. Uh, it is <laughs> in front now. Also. <laughs> So what do you think about this? 
I mean, look, I'm an American, so, you know, um, Polish national security issues are the business of the Polish people and those who are empowered to uh, do it. Um, unless they're doing something that is going to get my country involved in the conflict, um, I don't care. I mean, and so it's really up to him. Now, as a military person, just to take a step back, and, and if you want me to evaluate this, um, I think it would take Russian combat engineers less than five minutes to breach this. Um, understand that it's not a defense in depth. So, um, you know, any uh, Polish troops that are beyond that will be suppressed by artillery fire, by direct fire, by, uh, in, you know, by aircraft, whatever. Um, they'll be suppressed while the combat engineers come in and either blow the obstacles in place or take a bulldozer and push them aside. It will take five minutes to breach that. So this is a purely symbolic thing. That's what we need to understand. It's not a real defense. It's symbolic. And what it's saying is that Poland believes that it is being threatened by Belarus. Well, if Poland was being threatened by Belarus and that's the defense that Poland's putting up, then Poland is pretty pathetic when it comes to the, its ability to defend itself because that doesn't stop anything. Um, it's purely a political move um, and it's pathetic. It, it really is pathetic. You know, the Belarusians aren't losing any sleep, but neither are the Russians in Kaliningrad. They, I can guarantee you there's not a single Russian officer that's up at night going, how are we going to get through those obstacles? Um, because, well, first of all, Russia's not interested in invading Poland. I mean, that this, this shows actually not only the moral cowardice and the physical cowardice of Poland. And yes, I'm sorry to call you cowards, but this is what it shows. You're cowards. Um, it also shows the intellectual cowardism of Poland. Oh, why would you need to do this? What is the purpose of this? What are you trying to achieve? What points are you trying to make? Who are you trying to impress? Because it's not a real defense. You're doing it to generate some sort of emotional reaction from who? Are you trying to intimidate the Belarusians, intimidate the Russians? Are you trying to scare the Polish population? What is the purpose? And if this uh, minister of defense has any integrity, he'd come out and explain what he's up to, because it's not about defenses. This isn't going to stop anybody. No one will be stopped by this. Um, so what's it about? It's about generating fear, generating fear, and by creating something out of nothing. Fear usually is generated from ignorance, uh, where people are uncertain. They don't know. And... Um, uh, and well, uh, I'll pass it back to you while the dogs bark here for a second. <laughs> we have people at the door, so um, I'll tell you, turn it back to Bruno, mute my microphone, and I'll be right back. <laughs> Yes, so maybe maybe you, you have a question concerning what told already Scott Ritter. Uh, so uh, you can comment. No, I agree with the fact uh, uh, that uh, uh, all this uh, Buashtak line and all this propaganda is about fear. Um, but I don't know really uh, um, why the power in Poland, the government in Poland needs uh, needs fear. But I, I'm sure it's not fear against Russian or Belarusians. It's fear against Poles because uh, Polish people uh, has to be convinced by its government that Poland is a powerful nation able to be uh, to be uh, um, to defend itself. And of course, it's uh, as Scott Ritter told, it's pathetic because uh, Polish army um, uh, is not uh, uh, um, able to fight against uh, Russia and Belarus. And especially Russia doesn't need to, to take the control of Poland. Uh, and that's the basic, basic issue. So, um, good morning <laughs> to the dog. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is the terrorist who makes all the noise in the world, and the best way to silence him for me right now is just to hold him. So, uh... 
Yes. For Poland, this is Maverick. Maverick, this is Poland. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, I will read another question. A few days ago, the Oscars ceremony took place. And on this occasion, I would like to ask a question. Who do you think is a better actor, Navalny or Zelensky? What do you think about the fact that Zelensky was not invited to this ceremony and the Oscar was given to the film about... Um, Navalny and it was an opportunity for his wife to make a public appearance. Does this mean uh, Zelensky popularity in Hollywood, in Hollywood is beginning to fall? Navalny supported the Russian intervention in Georgia in 2008 and has repeatedly emphasized that Crimea is a part of Russia. What do you think about this award for Navalny? Well, I think, first of all, you're giving the... Um the uh, Screen Actors Guild far too much uh, credit. Um, they're not that smart, they're not that clever, they're not foreign policy experts, they know nothing about anything. Uh, and I'm just saying this with all honesty, they're actors, uh, they, they practice an art, but they're not intellects, they make a lot of money. And so sometimes they are able to use that money to wear fancy clothes and go to gala events and people put a microphone in front of them and they say things about things they don't know. I'll give you an example. Sean Penn, a great actor. I support Sean Penn's art um, all day long, uh, from Fast Times to Ridgemont High, all the way up through, you know, um, uh, Mystic uh, River and, and beyond. This this is a this is a man of great talent. He doesn't know anything about Ukraine. If he did, he wouldn't go meet Zelensky the way he did. He doesn't know anything about the world. Um, and yet when Sean Penn speaks, suddenly people are listening and saying, oh, my gosh, Sean Penn said X, Y and Z. Don't listen to Sean Penn. He knows nothing. He's a nobody. He's an actor. That's it. That's all he is. It's an actor. It's the same thing with Bono, you know, the singer. Bono suddenly speaks about something. and Everybody goes, wow, how profound. No, no, no. How profoundly stupid because Bono doesn't know anything. So all the people that are sitting there evaluating the Oscars and saying, wow, what kind of deep message are these actors, uh, these directors, these cinematographers, these sound people who know how to make a movie but don't know anything about the world we live in? What message, what sophisticated message are they trying to send? Are they sending a message that says Zelensky's on the way down, but Navalny's on the way up? You know, they don't know about Navalny's position with Georgia. They're not that smart. They don't know about Navalny's position about Crimea. They don't know that Navalny's a right-wing um, racist who uh, has said horrible things about uh, the people of the Caucasus, comparing them to cockroaches and uh, making a commercial where he shoots one of them. Um, they don't know that. They haven't even done the time uh, to, to research the fact that Navalny was recruited by the CIA, was sent to a special uh, gathering at, 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 I believe it was uh, Yale University, uh, where his CIA handlers coached him on how to create an opposition movement, that he is a paid CIA asset, and this movie has been promoted by the CIA itself. So you thank you, Oscars. You gave an Oscar to a CIA product. How stupid can you be? Oh, wait a minute. We already established. They're pretty stupid. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to read too much into what these shallow, pathetic people have done. They're not you know, rocket scientists, they're not geopolitical analysts, they're actors, they're directors, they're sound people, they're cinematographers, they're artists, but they don't know anything about diplomacy or the world we live in. Yes, but there are some uh, intelligent actors, for example, Steven Seagal, or intelligent singers like um, Richard w Waters from Pink Floyd. Uh, yeah, but here's the difference, here's the difference. They don't just talk the talk, they walk the walk. Okay, Steven Seagal made a decision that he wanted to uh, reject the uh, anti-Russian politics of the United States, so he moved to Russia, became a Russian citizen. Okay, you see, that's a little bit different than acting. That's called real. That's called life. Uh, you know, Roger Waters you know, has been a politically motivated singer for some time now, but he's taken his show out on the road uh, to you know, to make a point about uh, the war. He's spoken out, he's engaged uh, in these things. But even, you know, Roger Waters, with all, with all due respect, he's, 
he's an artist. And, you know, as much as I support the message he's putting out there, I think that he is open to being criticized by other people who make the same argument. He's just an artist. He's not, you know, he's not an expert. I happen to agree with the positions that Roger Waters have put out there, but I would respect other people who came out and said, yeah, but Scott, he's, he's just a singer. He's a songwriter. Um, why should we listen to him more than we listen to anybody else? And that's a, that's a fair question. That's a legitimate question. Speaking of Georgia, a few days ago, there was an attempted coup in, in this country, which is part of the strategy of color revolution. Georgia, like Ukraine, is a country loyal to the U.S., that wants to join nato georgia like ukraine is a country that can be described as anti-russia why, why are americans trying to organize a coup in a country that emphasizes loyalty to the usa well because it's not as simple as you say uh, georgia is a complicated country um i mean when we study the you know just the history of georgia understand You know, do people understand that not only was there an Abkhazian war from 1992 to 1993, there was a Georgian civil war in 1993, uh, a civil war between the Mingrelians of Gamsakudia and the rest of the Georgians led by Edward Shevardnadze. So the idea that Georgia speaks with one voice is absurd in the extreme. Um, you know, uh, Saakashvili uh, had to go in and, you know, threaten the use of force to suppress a Jarian independence. Um, again, not something you do with a, you know, a, a, a nation that's, you know, uh, unified. So Georgia is a deeply divided nation. What the United States has been doing for the past several years is trying to promote a soft coup um, in Georgia. You see, you say Georgia is a nation that supports the United States. Georgia is a nation that supports the promise and the premise of American assistance, um, because that's what Georgia needs right now. It's a poor country with limited resources and it needs American assistance. Um, but not every Georgian buys into that. For instance, the former prime minister, uh, Bezina uh, Ivanishvili, I think his name was, a billionaire, for, uh, made his money in Russia, became the prime minister, and everybody accused him of being a pro-Russian prime minister. Now, wait a minute, how can you have a pro-Russian prime minister if Georgia's talking about joining NATO. You see how conflicted Georgia is right now. So you can't sit there and, and make absolute statements. His party, Georgia Dream, is in power today. Um, um, the, the current prime minister is a man that was mentored by the former prime minister. And this prime minister has come out straight up and said, we are not opening up a second front against Russia. We're not going to do that. And they've said, we oppose this ability of foreign money to come in and take control of Georgian society. That's why the thing that led to the, the, the unrest was the, uh, the, the, the decision by the parliament to uh, you know, consider a, a piece of legislation, the Foreign Registration Act, Foreign Agents Registration Act, um, that would any, any non-governmental organization, other civil societies that received up to 20% of their funding from foreign sources had to register and tell people. This is what we did. And you know what would happen if they did that? You'd suddenly find out that almost every non-governmental organization in Georgia is owned and operated by the United States. So things that are being called civil society and things that are being promoted as, you know, grassroots movement by Georgians isn't. What it is, is America coming in, trying to shape Georgia, to reshape Georgia in the image of America. And that image is not necessarily something that Georgia wants. Again, another example, uh, the United States has been promoting diversity. Um, and so what we've done in the promotion of diversity is to encourage uh, the kind of rights in Georgia that are automatic in the United States, uh, you know, rights for LGBTQ uh, people, uh, gays, etc. But when they, there was a gay pride parade, the, the, Georgia, the Georgia Dream Party shut it down. Why? Because that's not what conservative Georgia, that's not what traditional Georgian society uh, embraces. But the United States is trying to impose that on it to break up traditional Georgian society. Why? Because traditional Georgian society isn't going to go to war against Russia for the United States. They did that once. That's what a lot of people forget. 2008, you know, my wife is from Sukumi, Georgia. Um, her family was ethnically cleansed during the 1992-1993 fighting. So it's a deeply personal issue for me. 
Um, and I, as much as any Georgian out there, want Abkhazia returned to Georgian control and want Sukhumi once again to be a city where the Georgian residents can return to their homes and live their lives. Um, but you, you, this can't be done through force of arms. Georgia tried that. They fought a war and they lost and a lot of people died. This is something that has to be done through negotiation. And what a lot of people don't realize is that in, um, in, in 2008, in the first half of 2008, Dmitry Medvedev, who at that time was the president of Russia, was meeting with Saakashvili on a frequent basis to discuss the terms under which, the conditions under which Abkhazia and Georgia could be reunited. Imagine that, a Russian leader talking about reuniting Georgia with Abkhazia. South Ossetia is a more difficult problem, but that was on the table as well. What did the United States do? Condoleezza Rice flew into Tbilisi, Georgia in July and, um, and told Saakashvili, stop it, cut it out. You're not gonna have these negotiations with the, uh, with the Russians anymore. And Saakashvili shut it down. And then they said, rather than you know, negotiate with the Russians on this, you need to emphasize the illegitimacy of the ongoing Russian occupation. And we encourage Georgia to start speaking out about the necessity of the return of these territories to Georgia. Now, she didn't say invade South Ossetia, but she hinted that that was the course of action that the United States was because they shut down diplomacy. They shut down diplomacy and, and yet said, at the same time they shut down diplomacy, you have to talk about getting these territories back. And Saakashvili went, so you mean we're going to do military action, you're gonna back us up. And Condoleezza Rice went, you have to get these territories back. So now Saakashvili sends his army to war. They invade South Ossetia. It's a short war, five days, the Russians counterattack, crush the Georgians, push them out. Um, but in the middle of this war, as the Russians are counterattacking, the United States is meeting. And now we know from Condoleezza Rice's own book, what she said happened. There were people screaming, how do we help the Georgians? Let's put airplanes over Tbilisi. Let's put the Roki tunnels to prevent reinforcements. But, um, Stephen Hadley, the uh, secretary or the uh, national security advisor, uh, said, how many people here want to go to war against Russia for Georgia? And the answer was none, none. So any Georgians listening, I'll reiterate what we knew back then. America will not go to war for you. We will not die for you. We don't like you. And Poland, let me extend this to you too. We're not going to go to war for you either. We don't like you. You're only there to do our bidding. You're only there to create chaos and, and crisis. But if it actually gets into a shooting war between you and Russia, we're not going to be there. Oh, wait a minute, Scott. All your army's there. Our army can't fight. Please understand that. Our army can't fight the Russians. We don't have enough of us. We would all die. And you'll all die with us. So let's knock this garbage off. The only way to deal with the Russians is through diplomacy, through negotiations. If you try to get into an arm wrestling match with the Russians, they're going to pin you every time. The Polish President Duda announced that Poland would hand over the first four MiG-29 fighters to the Kiev regime in the coming days. What do you think about it? I would ask Poland to send five. Now you ask me why five? Because the Russian pilot that goes up against him can shoot all five of them down and become an ace. And then he can get the gold star and he'll be a hero of Russia. If you only send four, you're cheating the guy. He's going to shoot down four Polish aircraft, but he's not going to become an ace and it's going to be very disappointing. So send five so that the Russian pilot who shoots them all down will get the gold star, a hero of Russia, and you'll be doing him and his family a great favor. What a joke. You really think four Polish MiG 29s? Do you know how old these airplanes are? Um, and you think they're going to, what, suddenly turn the tide of battle? Um, no. Ukraine had MiG-29s. They have a couple left, but they've all been shot down. That's what's going to happen to the Polish MiG-29s. They're going to be shot down. They don't stand a chance. They're not going to have any impact on this battlefield. And like I said, at least send five so Russia can get a new ace. But if you send four, you're just cheating them. Keeping yourself. Now I would like uh, to ask about Poland. Last week there was a political crisis in Poland which was provoked by the American television station TVN24 which broadcast 
a film about Pope John Paul II. This video revealed the cover-up of pedophilia by the Polish Pope, and this is nothing new. Everyone in Poland uh, has known about it for at least 20 years. Nevertheless, this film caused a scandal and a resolution was passed in the Polish parliament that forbids, forbids criticizing the Polish Pope. It was a very funny event because MPs from the ruling party held portraits of the Polish Pope during the vote. However, there was also a very serious event as the American ambassador was summoned to give explanations. The US ambassador to Poland is the son of the famous Zbigniew Brzeziński. His name is Marek Brzeziński and he publicly supports the liberal opposition party. In a few months, we have a parliamentary election in Poland and the summoning of the American ambassador by the Polish authorities is a historic event. For the first time in history, the Polish government dared to criticize American interference in Polish politics. Can we expect a colorful revolution in Warsaw soon? <laughs> I don't know. I, I doubt it. Um, no, you're already doing our bidding. I mean, you're, you're already our poodle. Uh, we, we tell you to jump, you jump. We tell you to sit, you sit. We tell you to roll over, you roll over. So, you know, sometimes dogs misbehave and um, and, and, and you have to punish them. So we'll punish you, but we're not going to replace you. You're, you're doing a good job right now being our poodle, our pet. And um, and that's it. You know, I, I don't know what did, um, what was the response of the American ambassador? Did he tell the Polish people to go to hell or did he apologize? <laughs> what, what did he, what did he do? Uh, Bruno, maybe you, you you will answer what he do. He didn't did nothing. I I, I didn't hear he 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 he, he reacted to that. Because uh, as, a, uh, no, as an no. American, as an American, no. First, I, the, the, the story was like this. Firstly, they make information that uh, uh, this ambassador must to come to to speak uh, to Polish uh, government. And few hours later, uh, they change the information that it is not. Uh, they don't push him in the by the violence, violence or something like that. But they invite him. They invite him to to uh, because somebody in the government understand that no, 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 we can't be angry to the United States. So already it was something very, uh, very funny. Uh, because as you see, the, the, the questions which you ask, uh, which I ask you, the, the, there are uh, it's a funny question because the role of the Poland, which uh, every day try to popula uh, tr try to say to Polish uh, politics, uh, Polish population, we are strong, we will have war with Russia, and uh, in the reality, uh, the the Polish state is in a deep crisis the polish army if is without without weapon without ammunition without nothing and in the but uh, they are preparing us to the to the war so so for me it's a well, I, I, yeah look I, I have to tell you as an american if you're going to summon my ambassador an american ambassador to uh be held to account for americans exercising freedom of speech that ambassador should have stormed in there. And as soon as your foreign minister opened mouth, she said, shut up, not one word, not one word. You don't get to lecture me about the constitutional rights of Americans. And if you do, this is over. I'm out of here. We're kicking out your ambassador and relations are done. Do you understand who is the boss right now? You're not the boss. You can talk to me if we've insulted the Polish people, if I said something wrong, if I violated Polish law. But when an American exercises freedom of speech, you shut up. You don't get to talk. You don't get to shut us up. But he didn't do that because we're weak, too. We're very weak. You know, but here's the problem with the Polish government here. I understand their sensitivities about the Polish Pope. I mean, he's a big deal. Um, he was the guy that helped guide Poland through, you know, the solidarity movement and the take down communism. And, oh, yay, Pope, you're a good man, good man. Then you find out well, hey, maybe he's not as good as everybody thought he was. You know, in America, we have the same problem. People are going back in history. Thomas Jefferson, 
one of the greatest Americans out there. I mean, he wrote the Declaration of Independence. You go to the Jefferson Memorial, there's words up there that just make you cry because they're so deep and, and they resonate so much. And apparently he liked to rape slave women and, um, and have children out of wedlock with slaves. He was a slave owner. Um, and, and we found out about this. Now, how does America deal with this? Do we take the people who raise this unconvenient, inconvenient truth and silence them? Or do we say, there it is, there it is. And now everybody gets to evaluate Thomas Jefferson with the totality of information available. You know, does this change the greatness of the Declaration of Independence? No. Does it mean that we would have uh, invited Thomas Jefferson over for dinner had we known everything? Probably no. Um, you know, but there it is. We're, at least you're being honest. And honesty is the key. So now let's go back to the Pope. The, this doesn't change what the Pope did to help Poland. It doesn't change it at all. He did what he did. And so it's possible to be proud of the man for what he did to help raise up solidarity movement, to help bring down communism, et cetera, and be critical of the man for his stance on, um, you know, pedophilia and, the, and priest sex abuse and things like that. The truth cannot be run. You can't run away from the truth because otherwise you're living a lie. And does Poland really want to live a lie? I don't want America to live a lie. I don't think Americans should run away or try to hide the truth about Thomas Jefferson or anybody, George Washington, any of our founding fathers. They're fair game. You know, the facts are the facts. The truth is the truth. Uh, all of it. And it has to be all considered. Why is Poland running away from this? Is Polish net modern day nationalism so weak that the pillar that you've built it on, one of the pillars, which is the role played by the Polish Pope in all of this, um, if, if that becomes shaky, that does that mean that Poland no longer stands for anything? Because that's what you're telling me. If you're telling me that you can't handle the truth about the Pope, because to do so will undermine confidence and the foundational thinking of what modern day Polish nationalism is, nationalism is, then it means Poland doesn't stand for anything. You're a very weak nation. Come on, Poland, be stronger, do better. Don't be afraid of your past. Embrace your past, all of it, the good, the bad, the ugly. Nobody's perfect, no nation's perfect, but what makes a nation good is the fact that it deals with the reality of the totality. Yesterday, I interviewed Russell Bentley, an American who has been living in Donbass for nine years and who fought in the ranks of the militia of the Donetsk People's Republic. Comrade Russell said that at least 10,000 Polish mercenaries are fighting in Ukraine who are very well trained and together with other mercenaries are, one, um, uh, are on the second front line. Poorly trained conscripts are sent to the front line and when any of them try to escape or surrender, second line mercenaries shoot them in the back. What do you think? Is 10,000 Poles fighting in Ukraine a credible number? Have you heard of foreign mercenaries murdering Ukrainian deserters? I've heard all of these stories. You know, the problem is what to believe. I'm not calling Mr. Bentley a liar. I'm saying that he has been told information. He's repeating that information. He's not an intelligence officer. Um, so I don't think he's in a position to evaluate the credibility of the sources of this information. We need to understand a couple things that, um, you know, there's a war, a serious war going on right now. And that serious war uh, isn't just on the battlefield, but it's in the, you know, the, the information space. There's propaganda being put out there by both sides designed to shape opinion. You know, as much as um, the collective West wants to put out information that's uh, critical of Russia and makes Russia look weak in order to get the Russian population to be concerned about this war, uh, the pro-Russian side wants to do the same thing, to fire up uh, Polish, uh, the civilian population, uh, et cetera. And I would imagine that if the Polish population, um, you know, found out that there's 10,000 uh, well-armed, well-trained, well-equipped Polish mercenaries on the ground in uh, in in uh, Ukraine who are engaged not necessarily in combat to fight the Russians, but murdering Ukrainians 
uh, Ukrainian boys who were kidnapped from their street, thrown to the front line and don't want to be there, that that could change the Polish attitude about this war. So I just say that we have to take everything with a grain of salt. Um, you know, there's there's information, anecdotal information coming from the Russian side. Uh, and I've talked to uh, Russian officers who claim this to be the case, that uh, when they listen to the radio traffic, especially in the areas like opposite Lugansk and Donetsk, uh, that all they hear is Polish. Um, that's the number one language, It's uh, which would imply that there's a, a significant number of Polish troops there. And there's, you know, real information that some Poles have been killed. Um, other information suggests that thousands of Poles have been killed and that their bodies have been returned in great secrecy. I don't know what the truth is on that one. I don't know, you know, if Mr. Bentley's right, wrong. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a serious issue. But you know what I do know is that if uh, I'm a Polish citizen and I've received information that 10,000 of my fellow citizens are off fighting in uh, Ukraine, that that's something I'd want my government to investigate. And uh, so it shouldn't, it's not a question that should be asked of me. It's a question that should be asked of the Polish government. Are there 10,000 Polish troops in Ukraine fighting right now? If so, what is their mission? What have you authorized them to do, if anything? Are they there with your permission or without your permission? Um, are they operating as a de facto adjunct of the Polish security services? Are they a covert advance party to seize Western Ukraine? These are things that the democracy should be, uh, you know, if you're really a democracy, these are things that people in a democracy should be asking their government and demanding the answer. It's not up to Russell Bentley to come up with this information. It's up to the Polish people to demand this information from their government. Bruno, do you want to add something to this? Yes, I, I think that that's <laughs> that's the, the, the main issue. I mean, uh, uh, in Poland, they don't ask that. There is something like a monolithism, uh, apart from, of course, uh, minority position, uh, real opposition group. Uh, 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 both leading parties of Poland are agreeing uh, uh, on the policy uh, against Russia, on the policy in Ukraine, and they don't want people to know what's happening in Ukraine. Um, so in a certain sense, uh, Poland and most of Eastern European countries are not democracies because there is no pluralism. Uh, um, <laughs> Unfortunately, I would say in most Western countries, the level of democracy is diminishing everywhere in the United States, in France, in Germany, in England. Uh, but uh, um, the worst is in uh, Central Eastern Europe, uh, where, uh, you know, after 1999, I would say e Central Eastern Europe was an experimental uh, terrain for uh, economical uh, reforms. Uh, neoliberal economical reforms, and they they did did they did it, and after uh, it was um, uh, enlarged to the all European Union. But after that, we had a more and more authoritarian regime in Eastern in Central Eastern Europe, and when I observe the situation now, is that um, the authoritarianism is going from the east to the west. Uh, and uh, the enlargement of the European Union to the east was um, was uh, 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 provoked uh, a degradation a, 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 of uh, democracy and pluralism in the west. And uh, I think that, of course, the Western uh, Western European establishment uh, accept that and wanted that, but against their own people. And that's the reason why. Now, um, Eastern Europe, Central Eastern Europe uh, joined the uh, EU. One of the reasons why, why Central Eastern Europe joined e EU, because uh, authoritarianism is, is the main trend in, in, in all the collective West. Uh, and that's why <laughs> such countries like Poland are where, uh, where the, on the forefront of this, of this tendency. That's my point of view. We can discuss, of course, about that, but uh, that's my point of view because, uh, you know, you have a lot of people that were arrested in Poland and nobody cares about that in the Western uh, so-called free world. You, know, you will tell me that Assange in England also is, is under arrest. I agree. But uh, it began earlier in Central Eastern Europe than in Western Europe. 
<laughs> maybe maybe we will discuss how to build the international anti-war movement. Yeah, yeah, that's... Scott participated in the demonstration uh, rage against the war machine and uh, in Europe in last uh, times we also had some uh, some demonstration in my back you see the uh, demonstration in Bydgoszcz which taken place in last Saturday it was the anniversary 24 anniversary uh, when the polling joining NATO and it was the not very big because 500 people but it is the first time when we had the demonstration against poland in nato so it's a historical event uh, uh, it is uh, it's mean it is not our war so don't send polish uh, weapons polish army polish money to to help uh, uh, regime of zelensky uh, and uh, in in britain we have the conference no to nato no to war so i invited bruno to to communicate uh, each other uh, american anti-war movement european anti-war movement how to how to build it well uh, uh, let me just start by saying that um the American anti-war movement, there is no anti-war movement. We have people who want to become an anti-war movement and they're trying to become an anti-war movement. There's no viable anti-war movement. We have uh, progressives who uh, express a one interpretation of an anti-war, but we don't even have a common definition of what anti-war means. Um, and this is this is problematic. And, you know, and, 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 and so, you know, we knew, for instance, in, um, in 2002, that when we said anti-war, we meant don't invade Iraq. We all, there was common agreement on that. So we could get common agreement around the world. And I believe there was a global anti-war movement based upon the notion of do not invade Iraq. Once we invaded Iraq though, that movement collapsed mm -hmm. because now they didn't know what they stood for, what they were going on. Um, you know, are they gonna be accused of being pro Saddam? Are they gonna, you know, are you against the soldiers now that the soldiers and Marines are engaged in combat? Are you somehow by protesting the war being unpatriotic and all these complex issues come in and the movement. And then of course, the greatest uh, weapon that was deployed against the anti-war movement was um, electing Barack Obama as president of the United States, because what was really driving the anti-war movement was George W. Bush. As long as George W. Bush was president, people could foam at the mouth and get angry at him. But the same issues existed when Obama came in, but suddenly he was given the Nobel Peace Prize and the anti-war movement went away and uh, they just turned a blind eye to all the things that we would have condemned had George W. Bush. So it was a political movement, um, a partisan political movement, not designed to be anti-war, but to be anti a given political party. Um, and that's where we are today. There's a deep divide in the United States where, you know, a lot of Democrats are hesitant to join the anti-war movement because we have a Democratic president. Uh, the Republicans are, you know, the, those that join, libertarians, Republicans join uh, because they don't like Joe Biden. <laughs> I mean, that's it. It's That's not an anti-war movement. That's an anti-Joe Biden movement. Um, just like if Donald Trump was the president, the Democrats wouldn't be anti-war. They'd be anti-Donald Trump. Um and, and, and this, this is this is problematic because how do we motivate people now from around the world uh, who think they want to join an anti-war movement only to find out that in America, it's all about partisan politics. Uh, who do you support? Because you think you're supporting this side, but you're getting, you, you, you think you're joining an anti-war movement, but you find out you're actually just there to advocate on behalf of Joe Biden against Donald Trump or you know, let's say you joined Donald, you know, a right wing side, you're advocating for Donald Trump against Joe Biden. It's about partisan American politics. And you're not going to build an American anti-war movement uh, as long as this happens. And you're not going to build an international movement. So I think we have to come up with, I, I think, for instance, the war in Ukraine is too hard. It's too hard to galvanize an anti-war movement. Too, too difficult. Um, but the good news is, it's not going to be a war in Ukraine much longer. So we'll be debating history, not reality. Um, what what then could the anti-war movement, I, I, I think there's actually a, a chance to have an anti-nuclear war movement. That, like the Iraq war, is something I think everybody could agree on. 
And in Poland, this is especially relevant because there's been some Polish politicians who have said they want the B-61 bombs moved from Germany to Poland. They want NATO's nuclear umbrella to be forward deployed. And uh, this would be a chance for Poland to actually have a very good um, a debate about the role of nuclear weapons in, um, in, in NATO and what that means to have them on Polish soil. Because I'll tell you what it means. It means Poland becomes a radioactive wasteland if there's a nuclear war. And the great Polish farm country, you won't grow anything. Your city's radioactive wasteland. Do you really want that? Is that something you want? Or maybe now that you've become educated about the reality of what happens if you, you know, embrace this nuclear umbrella fully, maybe the Poles will start to say, well, is there a solution that doesn't involve nuclear weapons? Is there a way that we can secure ourselves without nuclear weapons? And the answer is yes, arms control. Sitting down with the Russians to come up with a agreed upon process to eliminate, reduce, control, contain nuclear weapons. And Poland could be a part of that. So could every nation in Europe. So could the United States. And now guess what we got? An international anti-war movement that stands for something that's achievable. Yes, that, that's, a, that's a pretty good idea because uh, yesterday I talked with an Italian uh, anti-war movement and exactly he told that, that in Italy pe people are much more uh, um, engaged in anti-war because there are a uh, nuclear bomb in, in American ba bases in, in Italy and they are aware of that because it's for a long time. Poles are still not aware because it's beginning of the beginning of the story. But for the Italians, it's already, uh, you know, 20 or 30 years ago or more, much more even. So so uh, that that would be good to have contact between different countries uh, to make people uh, conscious of what happened in, in other countries. I, I guess, for example, if you, you invite Italian in Poland and this Italian will will explain what means already now the the, the nuclear bomb uh, bases in Italy. Uh, it it can help Poles to understand uh, what they are going in now. Um, so that's quite important. Um, and another aspect is also that when I talk with uh, let's say simple people, most of them are are anti-war. But the problem begins with the elite and the intellectuals, uh, and uh, which are uh, divided by the idea of left-wing parties, right-wing parties, and they don't really, um, they they cannot um, be active as it was at, at the moment of the Iraq War. Um, not only in the United States, in the whole world, uh, things were very clear at the time of Iraq War, um, and now they are not very clear because. The, the people who organized the anti-Iraq war now are, are divided along, uh, let's say, pseudo-political uh, 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 um, uh, group, because it's, it's not even a real uh, ideological uh, difference. It's a, it's a, a mythical, uh, something like a tribal belongings. I'm belonging to the tribe of the Republican or the Democrat. It's something more in the United States, but in other countries, it's, the, it's more or less the same. Uh, the so-called left and the so-called right, it's establishment left and establishment right. It has nothing to do with basic, uh, the former basic ideological differences we had at the time between real left and real right. I think that the most important for building the anti-war movement is the definition who is the aggressor. And I, I stand in the position that the aggressor is NATO, the aggressor is the Western imperialism. And uh, in the, the conference which it, uh, was were organized by George Galloway was named No to NATO, No to War. So the NATO, it's, uh, <coughs> it's, it's, it's the war. Uh, and uh, I think that to spread this anti-war uh, message, we need to talk about NATO because if not, uh, 
every everybody are against war. Zelensky, Biden, President Duda, and Morawiecki, they are also against war. But they said we are against war. It is why we need to send weapon to Ukraine, and Ukraine must take back uh, Crimea, Donbas, Moscow, uh, Vladivostok, and the war is over when the Ukrainian troops will take Vladivostok. So no, I am not <laughs> against war like this. I am against war now because every day of this war is the is the people who died in in Ukraine uh, and very often when i said with, that i am against nato they attacked me that i am against ukrainian no i am not against ukrainian i supported ukrainian i support these uh, young guys from the street of odessa or other uh, ukrainian cities where they hunting for the people they take these people by the force uh, and uh, stop the war now uh, it's the possibility that thousands of these people will not die uh, in this war so so the message is um uh, we must to be against nato we must to be against sending weapon to ukraine because without we without weapon without all this uh, help uh, from the nato's countries for the ukraine zelensky needs to negotiate the peace and uh, and uh, it's uh, it's the message and of course it's uh, it's uh, many of the politicians in the western countries they are not agree with this because they are corrupted by the allies by the nato and uh, and this is the problem well i have a, uh, yeah, i i have one question to scott um because uh, during the last 30 years we had uh, you know the neoliberal policies which tended to um, organize the deindustrialization of the western countries apparently um, in in most western country but especially in the united states the only industry which stayed at home is the military industry and this some people explain that this is why the uh, military um, uh, complex it's much is much more powerful than at the time of Eisenhower when Eisenhower already um, uh, told the American it's a danger uh, but it, it's worse now do you really do you think uh, the military uh, industrial complex in the United States is proportionally more important now than earlier so, and it would explain why the pro-war policies are much uh, much stronger absolutely i mean you know like anything uh that has been around a long time um unless it's on its deathbed uh it's generally maturing um it's like a tree getting deeper roots you know and becoming stronger etc you know during eisenhower the military industrial complex was, was small it was it was a, a small tree with some roots um Today, it's a massive tree with roots that go everywhere, uh, and it touches everything. Uh, it controls Congress uh, because Congress controls the money, but the money that gets Congress reelected comes from the money Congress gives to the defense industry and feeds back to Congress. So there's this little incestuous circle that takes place here. Um, it, 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 it controls academia um, uh, because... Uh, to become an expert, you have to be cycled through the Defense Department or the State Department where you are implementing policies that are driven by the need to have global tension that justifies a massive military budget. So, you know, I, I think today the, the, the military industrial complex, military industrial congressional complex is as big and as intertwined as it has ever been. Um, and that, you know, the, the, there's a danger. For instance, one of the things that we, uh, the, the, the name of the anti-war rally on February 19th was Rage Against the War Machine. And it was an attack against the military industrial complex. But it, it, that's a, it's very difficult to, to, to attack that. Now, I'll bring that down to, for instance, uh, Michael, what you said about um, NATO, that this has to be an anti-NATO movement. But the problem is, uh, there's not going to be the kind of widespread agreement on that up front. So if you lead with anti-NATO movement, you're going to lose a lot of people because they're not educated. They haven't thought it out. They'll, they'll, they'll fall back on their pre-existing conceptions. And if you're Poland, 
uh, there's a lot of people in Poland that say we need NATO to protect us from Russia. You know, we're afraid of Russia. Russia has nuclear weapons. Russia's this big country. We need NATO to protect us. So if you're telling us no NATO, you're scaring the heck out of me. I want NATO. But here's the thing. What happens if you um, start again with arms control? Instead of saying no, no, because, you know, there's a if you study strategy, I mean, we talk about Sun Tzu. Um, there's a uh, British uh, guy, strategist, uh, Little Heart, and he wrote a book called On Strategy or Strategy. Uh, and it's the beginning of the indirect approach. Rather than a frontal assault, you take an indirect approach to get to the objective. And if the objective is NATO, rather than a direct attack on NATO, the indirect approach is arms control, specifically NATO's nuclear umbrella. Should NATO's nuclear umbrella be part of a future arms control agreement? See, that's something that people could embrace because you're not attacking NATO. You're attacking, you're, you're questioning the validity of a nuclear you know, umbrella and NATO's role in having one. Uh, because for NATO to continue to have this, Russia said we can't have arms control now because you can't talk about limiting Russian nuclear weapons if you're not willing to limit NATO's nuclear weapons that are tied into the same nuclear policy that the United States has. Um, and here's the thing. Let's say we succeed in getting the new NATO's nuclear umbrella on the table. Now, the next question is, what is NATO after that? How do you define a post-nuclear NATO? And you see, I'm not threatening NATO at that point. I'm simply asking the question, how do you define a post-nuclear NATO? What becomes the mission of NATO? Um, is, is NATO, now that we've eliminated the nuclear threat from Russia through arms control that ties into NATO's nuclear arsenal, what is the relationship now between NATO and Russia? Does it need to be antagonistic? Does it need to be this militaristic? Do we need to have a um, heavily armed uh, frontier with Russia? Or can we start to walk away from that? Can we start redefining NATO? And as you start to redefine NATO, you can ask questions like, if we no longer have the nuclear umbrella, do we need the United States? What is the role of the United States in a post-nuclear NATO? Um, which is a legitimate question. Many are asking that question now in France and Germany and elsewhere. Maybe Poland could start asking that question. And then if you start to question what is the role of the United States, then you might begin to start saying, should NATO be transformed into a European treaty organization? where European powers deal with European security issues without the pressure of the United States, without being influenced by American national security objectives, where Europe is for Europe only. And now what we've just done there is we've gotten rid of NATO. And uh, you did it through the indirect approach by having a logic-based discussion that begins with nuclear weapons. Um, and I think that, that that's one way that, they, that can be done about it. That's why I'm a big fan of, um, of, of talking about disarmament, because disarmament links everything. Nuclear weapons are everywhere, and uh, they, they, they corrupt everything they touch. And the sooner that we can collectively talk about how to get rid of them, push them away, the better we can have more rational discussions then about what is national security? What is the proper relationship between Europe and Russia? Does it have to be antagonistic? You know, what would a European security framework look like that Russia's tried to talk about? What happens if you remove the United States from the equation? Does it become easier or harder to have a new European security framework? These are all fair questions that should be on the table. People should be willing to discuss them. And I think an anti-nuclear war movement would be a good vehicle to, uh, to encourage that. Bruno, could you say something about the activity of your organization and anti-war activity in France? Yes, so we created with quite a, with different party in the world, uh, political parties in the world, in Europe and outside Europe, what we called uh, anti-imperialist platform, um, and we have contact with different political parties linked with government or not. Uh, and um, uh, we are uh, organizing every three months a, a, a meeting in different uh, parts of the world, uh, tending to connect with new parties in new countries. We had the first one in Paris, then we had in Belgrade, 
Then we had in Caracas. The next one will be in Seoul in South Korea. And then we will have it in, in, in Africa. And each time we, we, we connect with other part, political parties that are against war, uh, against um, militarism and, um, and uh, imperialism. And we are trying to, to make the, the situation advance in this direction. Uh, last time, so I was in December in Belgrade. Uh, and of course, it was the moment where we had tensions in Kosovo, as you, you know, and uh, Serbian people were quite aware that uh, since the situation is in Ukraine is not good for NATO, maybe the, the, they will invent a new war and they were fearing that a new war can happen in Kosovo. But on the other side, you know, Serbian people are quite... Uh, you know, um, accustomed to the idea of war, and they say we don't really, we don't really fear war because we had already one. <laughs> that was the reaction I, I I had from the street in Belgrade, <laughs> which which was surprised me quite a lot. But uh, but uh, that's uh, that what uh, I, that was I, I I remember from it. Is it a question for Scott? Uh, what does Scott Ritter think about the conditions and terms for a truce and an end to the conflict that China gives for Ukraine? Well, first of all, we don't know what the Chinese proposal is going to be. Um, we, we know that China put out a 12 point peace concept uh, that had been largely rejected by the United States and Europe. Uh, Ukraine thought it was interesting. Um, and Russia said it doesn't meet all of our needs and uh, it, it, it's not acceptable the way it is. Um, but that's what's called a trial balloon. You know, that was the reconnaissance, uh, the diplomatic reconnaissance. Float that up there, see what happens, regroup. And since that time, a couple things have happened. The Chinese foreign minister has come to, uh, to, to, to Moscow and has had in-depth discussions with his uh, Russian counterparts. Uh, and I'm sure that the Russian ambassador to China is busy having discussions with, you know, people there. And Vladimir Putin gave a speech on February 21st. And I think people should always be governed by the words of the Russian leader when trying to figure out what Russia is going to do and what Russia could accept. Um, you know, he said a couple things are interesting. The number one priority, he said, of Russia uh, with the special military operation is the economic and social uh, rehabilitation of the Novoya Russia territories. He didn't use that term, I don't believe, but we're talking about Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Long, uh, uh, Lugansk, um, and, 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 and building them up, bringing them up to Russian standards. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to, to make civil life, civil society functional in those areas. That's his number one priority. He didn't say, onward to Odessa, onward to Kharkov, Onward to Kiev. He didn't say any of that. He said we need to repair the uh, social and economic well-being of these territories. He did say that Russia will be pushing the Ukrainians back from Russia's borders. That means Novaya Russia, Russia's borders to the maximum range of the mo longest range system provided to Ukraine by NATO. That's about 150 kilometers, which is the range of the HIMARS system with the small bomb unit, unit missile. Um, 150 kilometers. Now, what does 150 kilometers give you? Odessa, Nepopetrovsk, Kharkov. Uh, so <laughs> if Ukraine wants to continue this war, Russia is going to be taking those cities. Putin has just said that. I am not making anything up. He basically said it. So if this war continues... Ukraine is going to lose Odessa, and that means they're going to lose all the Black Sea coast because Russia won't stop at Odessa. They'll link up with Transnistria. They're going to lose Nepopetrovsk, which means Russia is going to push all the way to the Dnieper River. That's what they're going to do. So Ukraine is going to be cut in half. That's what's going to happen if this war continues, guaranteed. Now, what he didn't say is demilitarization is defined by the total destruction of the Ukrainian military. He said demilitarization is defined by pushing the Ukrainians back so that they can't impact the Russian borders. Now, if Russia absorbs Odessa, Kharkov, Nepopetrovsk, and all those other territories as Russia, now we're getting pushed into, you know, towards the Polish border. Different thing. Which means that Ukraine ceases to exist as a modern nation state. Straight up. 
The other thing he didn't say in the speech is uh, denazification requires the termination of the Zelensky government. So now we go back to precedent. We know that Vladimir Putin, even though they articulated denazification as one of the number one priorities, Vladimir Putin was willing to sit down with Zelensky on one April of last year and have a peace agreement that allowed the Zelensky government to survive. Um, is that still on the table? We don't know. What we do know is that historically speaking, heads of state don't travel to the capitals of close allies with other heads of state to have a discussion where the outcome hasn't been already determined. President Xi would not travel to Moscow if there was still a question about the, the content of this peace proposal. Russia and China, I believe, have already agreed upon the basic principles of this peace proposal. The question now isn't the substance, but the tactics. How do we go about doing this? And it has to be a peace proposal that ha is realistic or else it's a joke. And President Xi and President Putin, they're not in the business of jokes. They're not in the business of, of doing you know, things that, that they have no substance. These are serious men who lead serious nations. So this is going to be a serious peace proposal. One, that if presented properly to Ukraine, and President Xi apparently is going to have a video conference with Zelensky, uh, should give the Ukrainians um, a, a legitimate off-ramp from this war. And I would tell you, uh, an off-ramp that allowed them to keep Odessa, Kharkov, Nepopetrovsk, all these other non-Russian territories, to keep them, to preserve them. One that allowed them to keep their army intact, but pushed back 150, a demilitarized zone. One that said no to NATO, but maybe to the European Union. This is a whole lot better than saying you're going to die, which is the alternative. See, China will put something on the table to uh, Zelensky that gives Zelensky a, an off-ramp from this war that allows a viable Ukraine to exist. The alternative is Putin unleashes the dogs of war and this thing comes to its violent, inevitable conclusion sometime by the end of summer, early October. Now you're the West listening to this. Now, we don't want Russia to win, but <laughs> Russia's going to win. There's nothing we can do to stop it. Um, and as Russia achieves victory, then ugly scenarios come up. Does Poland move into Western Ukraine? Does Moldova, does Romania move into Moldova and threaten uh, Transnistria? Um, these are things that we would hopefully never have to discuss, and we wouldn't have to discuss if this peace agreement was signed on. So, and, and then what do you do if Russia wins? How do you afford to keep NATO up? Because now you're going to have to rapidly, you're going to have to revamp, rebuild all of these militaries. And the price tag's quite high in a post-sanctions economic reality where everybody's economy is doing bad. You can't afford to rebuild your military, not with Russia as the enemy. And so I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on the West to accept a realistic peace proposal. So I think that what China's doing is um, is the right thing for all parties involved. The chance to bring an end to this conflict. Is it going to be perfect? Look, there's a lot of Russians, and I know this because I've heard it from them, that are already mad at me for saying this. How dare you say this? Russia suffered too much. Russia would never accept these proposals. You know, we're going all the way. I respect that. I'm just telling you, people ask me about China, and my interpretation of what China's up to leads me to believe that they want to put something re realistic on the table and that Russia... The Russian leadership in their effort to avoid escalation of conflict that could lead to a direct conflict with uh, NATO and nuclear conflict. Russia might be willing to hold its nose on things that the Russian people might not be in, in, in favor of. Um, how about the Ukrainians? We're never going to give up Crimea. We're never going to give up Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donbass. Well, you're going to have to give it up if you want to survive as a nation state. So there's going to be a lot of stink compromises being made here but the end result could be a termination of the conflict and the beginning of a process of rebuilding trust and confidence between the West and Russia uh, through the rehabilitation of Ukraine that leads to a new European security framework along the lines of what Russia was articulating for before this war began. So I'm, um, I'm optimistic about the, the Chinese, um, the, 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 the intent of China I'm not optimistic about the outcome. I think this might be just too hard to do, too many obstacles, but China has to try and Russia has to be seen as trying because that'll give Russia more credibility 
uh, when if they are called upon to finish this thing through uh, violence and force of arms. Uh, Scott, could you tell us something on China negotiating peace between Iran and Saudis? <laughs> well, first of all, wow, congratulations, China. That's some world-class diplomacy. Um, you know, it's a shame my country didn't do that, but again, my country is the one that is creating the conditions for Saudi Arabia and Iran to be at war with one another because that's what we do. We seek instability, chaos, etc. We don't like anybody. This is proof positive. We know we don't like the Iranians, but now we're being told we don't like the Saudis either because what we're trying to get the Saudis to do is go to war against Iran, and that would be the destruction at the end of Saudi Arabia. Um, we don't like the Yemenis because we've allowed Saudi Arabia to go to war against them and starve thousands, hundreds of thousands of children to uh, death. Um, so here we come down to this. What the Chinese did is bring together two nations who were going to emerge from the American chaos um, in a very poor position. And they convinced them that the best thing to do is rather to be confrontational, to be cooperative. And so they've reestablished their diplomatic relations. They've re-engaged on a treaty of non-aggression that, and Saudi Arabia is straight up saying that Saudi territory cannot be used as a base to attack um, uh, Iran, which means it's, it's all over. If the United States can't use Saudi territory, we have no ability to do this. But the most important thing is the context that this is taking place in. Iran and Saudi Arabia, two big oil producers, are both trying to join BRICS. Iran has already been accepted. Saudi Arabia is in the process of applying. BRICS, of course, is the uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa economic forum that is a competitor to the G7. Saudi Arabia is leaving the Western orbit and going into the eastern orbit. This is a game changer. This radically transforms global geopolitics um, on a scope and scale uh, beyond imagination. It's thrown the United States, it's thrown Israel into a kilter. They don't know what to do now because all the assumptions they made about the Saudis always being there as a compliant you know, poodle of America, um, those assumptions are gone. Saudi Arabia has left the dog pound. Saudi Arabia's on the other side, they got a new owner. Um, and I'm not saying that China's owning them, I'm just coming up with a metaphor that might not be the most, uh, the, the, the best one, but it's, it's, it's a game changing event. Um, and here in the West, we're not giving China credit. This is the kind of stuff that wins Nobel Peace Prizes. This, and if China can pull off a peace treaty in Ukraine, Xi Jinping should be standing in um, Oslo, Norway, getting the Nobel Peace Prize for, for this. This is outstanding stuff. But in the West, we tend to dismiss it. Well, it's not that big a deal. It's not. Well, that's just us being in denial because it's a huge deal and it changes everything. Bruno, do you want to add something, for example, for the economic consequence of this question, the future of dollar? Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I think that we can um, consider that the war, uh, the Ukraine-Russia uh, war, is of course a NATO-Russia war, but it's also a, a war a, a, against dollar, or it became a war against dollar, and it's very important. And I think that it explains why a lot of country of the global South didn't stand against Russia and began to to have a commercial relation uh, relation in in local values in in ruble in yuan in rupees in uh, dirham and so on and uh, all that is uh, is a threat to the american hegemony in the world and that that what makes me um a little bit nervous because uh, if you take the the if you under uh, if you try to understand uh, the, uh, the the American establishment interest, if dollar will will not be anymore the 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 the, the central value, the central money of the world, it's finished with American hegemony in the world. And it, are the uh, uh, American elite the elite um, um, capable, able to accept the fact that the United States would not be anymore the, 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 the hegemon of the world? That's the million dollar question. Um, <laughs> and, and, I, and I, right now the answer is no, we're not able to accept that. The American people tend to accept the notion that we're, we're exceptional, 
that uh, the world can't survive without us. And therefore, the world should gravitate around us. But, you know, the, the problem is that's fantasy. And uh, the world's changing and the, the reality's changing and we're just going to have to learn to adapt to it. The question, are we, are we going to adapt peacefully? Or are we going to adapt violently? And the history of America suggests that we're going to adapt violently. And uh, this is very problematic. Um, you know, hopefully the American people will, um, will prevent this, this violent devolution of American hegemony. Um, and the world needs to help us. And the way you help us is uh, rather than promoting the notion of, um, of, of, of an American superpower, you help edu- re-educate America by saying, calm down, big boy, we're done. And Poland could play a role in that. You know, right now, Poland is actually empowering the United States to behave irresponsibly, to behave as a global hegemon, as a regional hegemon, as a nation where the military counts more than diplomacy. Um, and Poland needs to understand that if that's the case, that Poland will be destroyed. And we've had this conversation before. There's no positive outcome for Poland if, if a war breaks out between the United States and Russia. Poland will be destroyed. So it's in Poland's interest to get the United States to accept, uh, not defeat, but to accept a reinterpretation of the role of the United States in the world, where instead of being one leading many, it becomes one of many. And um, that still means America has a leading role, uh, you know, because we're a powerful nation. Uh, we've got a, you know, good economy, or maybe I don't know if the banks don't keep failing. Uh, we have an economy that's uh, that's okay, but um, you know, we have a lot of influence in the world. People will listen to us if we're speaking responsibly, but we have to learn to do that. And unfortunately, guys, I have to run right now. It's um, it, I'm turning into a pumpkin. Um, you know, to use the old American fable. So, uh, but thank you very much for inviting me. I appreciate the conversation. Maybe we can do it again sometime. Okay, Scott, uh, I would like to uh, uh, invite uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs uh, to, to conversation with us uh, because he is responsible for transformation, economic transformation of Poland, and it damaged a lot of bad things. But now he changed position. Now he is anti-war activist. So it's... Uh, it will be very interesting discussion and I see that uh, you have contact with Professor Sachs so could you could you invite him uh, to, to I'll, I'll, I'll do my best I mean I, I can't okay. guarantee an outcome but I can promise to do my best okay, okay thank you very much uh, for and and greetings for 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 Maverick okay thanks <laughs> have a good day guys thank you. Thank you.